Now it's my pleasure to announce the next keynote, keynote number two of this day. Our keynote speaker is Vice President um, um, of, at Fastly. He's a veteran, veteran in Internet Infra Technologies. And he's talking about um, why you should expecting more from the network edge. It's about edge computing, so it's about after having centralized <laughs> everything in the cloud, now thinking about, okay, maybe there's a reason also to partly decentralize things. Please welcome Human Beheshti. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I know you just had lunch and are really dying to go to nap. So I'm going to talk really fast for 20 minutes, make sure you're awake. Um, my name is Human. I'm with a company called Fastly. We're probably what you think of as a CDN. How many people know what a CDN is? There you go, my people. Um, I'm going to tell you a CDN story today. Uh, and after about 12 to 13, 15 years of orbiting the CDN industry, I joined Fastly about nine years ago, very, very sure that I knew exactly what a CDN was and I knew everything about a CDN. Uh, I was proven wrong within five minutes of joining the company, uh, not only in what a CDN can do and what uh, you can do with a CDN, but also the potential for where it was going and the sorts of things it could eventually do. Uh, and since then, I've been obsessed with this evolutionary story, and that's the evolutionary story that I'm going to um, tell you today. Well, uh, like any good story, there's a beginning, so let's go back to the beginning of time, and that in our world is right around 1997. Uh, we had a server sitting somewhere, probably a server farm, and we had a bunch of users that were probably all around the world, and somebody decided to use the magic of HTTP caching and some tricks with DNS, put a bunch of servers around the world, uh, and um, we call this a CDN. We got content close to the server, uh, close to the users, and we got content offloaded from the origin, and in a world that looked like this, the benefits of the CDN were very obvious. They gave us a, a, they gave us a performance um, a benefit because speed of light, you get things closer to users, things are faster. And they gave us a scalability benefit because we absorbed a lot of the load from those origin servers, so they were able to do a lot more. Better yet, we could actually use less of them, which means there were also cost savings. So this was amazing. It's a huge value add, huge uh, value prop, and to this day, even if our deployment models have changed, uh, to build an app that has any reasonable number of users uh, and has any reasonable amount of traffic without a CDN is probably not a very good idea. So if we go back 15 years or so, the promise of the CDN was great. We got scalability, we got performance, it's amazing. Operationally, though, it was a different story. Operationally, our world was filled with a lot of frustration. Why is that the case? Because when it came to configuration, for example, there's three areas that this was really the problem. When it came to configuration, we had to deal a lot with professional services. If, you've ever, if you dealt, dealt with CDNs 15 years ago, if you had a config change, it took four, five, six hours to roll it out to the network. It's very frustrating. You dealt with things like configuration locks where you couldn't change anything. You can only do, I don't know, two deploys a day if you were lucky. When it came to caching in your content, you had this one mechanism that HTTP gave you, which was a cache control header, in which you told the CDN how long it could cache something for. This was the only mechanism you had. And CDNs at the time had terrible invalidation models. Basically, once you sent something to the CDN, it was at the mercy of the network, and you couldn't do anything with it. If you wanted to invalidate it, maybe it took an hour. So there was no real use case for proper invalidation. And when it came to visibility, things were very slow and very um, uh, archaic, if you will. Maybe we got logs on an FTP server every once in a while. Maybe they were um, W3C compliant and they were, you know, they were in a particular format. Well, maybe we got them a couple of times a day. We had no control over what was actually logged and we certainly had no uh, control however quickly, how quickly they got to us. Now over time, maybe some things got better, and some of these things maybe went from terrible to just poor. But at the end of the day, and in hindsight, when we look back, the real problem was that we had no real APIs or no real programmatic interfaces to interact with these products. We had no real control over our configs. We had no real control over our deployments. We're at the mercy of these 
uh, vendors. We had no real control over our content. Any content that was dynamic was basically out of our control. We wouldn't cache it on the CDN. You, if you're using CDNs, you're probably doing this now, even. And we had, worst of all, we had no ability to react to any issues because we couldn't see things fast enough. The logs weren't coming in fast enough. We couldn't roll out configs fast enough, so we couldn't iterate quickly. And we had no control over our content. Now, we put up with this because, again, the value proposition was extremely powerful for CDNs, still is. And to be fair, this, these are very difficult problems. These, pro these are the sorts of problems that take time and an evolutionary cycle to get fixed. Um, but we dealt with them. Uh, we were at the mercy of the vendors, and there was nothing we could do about it. We just dealt with the anxiety, and we were frustrated all the time. Meanwhile, as you can see from this extremely uh, uh, informative infographic, things were getting slightly cloudier. What does that mean is we were deploying infrastructures programmatically. Uh, we had interfaces that gave us real-time feedback. We had real-time APIs which we could interact with these infrastructures with. We had real control, real-time control over our infrastructures and over the applications that we um, deployed over these infrastructures. And our deployments were becoming automated. We were building CI CD pipelines. We were integrating multiple cloud components into a single application, deploying them quickly, many, many times a day. This is when things were start, was starting to get become more uh, DevOpsy. And in this world, CDNs didn't play well, which is kind of ironic because if you think about it, the CDNs were kind of the first cloud. Uh, but as these normal, these new cloud infrastructures were enabling us to do more and more creative and interesting and quick things, the CDNs were kind of uh, left behind. And because of these things, because of these new interesting areas that the clouds were enabling us um, to venture into, uh, our content was actually getting more complicated. We were doing more interesting things with our content. We were doing uh, personalized content, more complicated content, and our caching policies which were still at the mercy of that header. Our caching policies were getting more and more and more complicated, which means we were doing, they couldn't be predicted as well. We were doing uh, less caching and our applications were getting less and less performant. All of this to say that if at this time, which is right around 10, 11 years ago, you were building an application and trying to deploy it to a CDN, you probably looked like one of these guys and were very frustrated. In fact, Fastly was born out of this frustration. Our founders look just like these guys. And I'm not going to get into the story of the birth of Fastly, uh, but that's how we were actually born. If you're interested in the story, come see me afterwards, and I'll tell you about it. But the short version is that CDNs essentially had to evolve. There had to, they had to be an evolutionary cycle that was able to bring them, give them, give them at least feature parity with what we were getting used to with um, our cloudy world. We made uh, big leaps in three areas. First, in configuration, CDNs started to get real-time APIs for configuration changes and configuration deployments. And instead of maybe deploying twice a day, we were able to deploy dozens of, dozens of times a day with configurations constantly going out into the system. That's great. We were focusing more on these APIs, and we're definitely focusing more on self-service, so the professional services engagements were less and less. Those are very frustrating. When it came to caching, uh, we started seeing real-time invalidation frameworks, which were powerful, which meant that now we can do reactive caching, or rather reactive uncaching. In the CDN world, we call this instant purge. And I have a demo to show you the power of this, because even though it's been a few years since instant purge came into the world, the power still shows best in a demo. Now, I'm not crazy enough to do a live demo, because I've done it many times, and I know that they don't work. So this is a recorded demo, but I promise it was live when I recorded it. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, I have a terminal, and on the right-hand side, I also have a terminal. I'm going to make requests. You won't see the requests here, the requests on the right-hand side terminal. To a URL on an origin server, where every time it hits the origin, a picture, a new picture of a guitar gets served. And it gets served with a very long uh, max age, with a very long, long cache control header. So it goes and stays on the, on the CDN. And I'm fetching it through a CDN. On the left-hand side, I'm going to send an API call to purge that. So what you're going to see is you're going to see a guitar. This is going to be the same guitar because it's being fetched from the CDN. Then I'm going to send a purge, and you're going to see how long it takes for a new guitar to show up, which is how quickly the content gets purged. So we start with this very simple flying V. We do a purge, and that's how quickly um, we get to purge the object, purge the content from um, the internet, uh, from the CDN. Uh, 
I ended it on this particular guitar because I have one like this and it's one of my favorite guitars and I figured showcasing it to a, obviously a guitar loving crowd is important. Um, this is, this idea of instant purge is extremely powerful because it took a model, a caching model that looked like this, where we had to predict how long we cache something for and turn it into this where we can now basically say cache forever. Now, this is not a legal cache control header, so please don't use this in your applications. Or if you do, t tell me about it and I'll give you a t-shirt. Uh, but this is an extremely powerful uh, model when it comes to caching, and it changes, it changed the game completely. Uh, what about visibility? Well, we were doing all these things with configuration in real time. Well, why shouldn't we be able to see what we were doing also in real time? So we were getting um, real time, we, we introduced real time stats through uh, APIs. We also got real time logging into these uh, um, products. And we got control over what we actually log. When I talk about real time logging, I mean users coming into a CDN infrastructure and a logging function basically streaming those logs directly to an endpoint of your choice. I'm gonna do a demo to show you the power of this too. Again, it is a live demo. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm making requests, and on the right-hand side, you see how quickly those get, this is a syslog demo, those get logged to a server. The server responding to the request on the left-hand side is 3,500 kilometers from the server that's logging on the right-hand side. This felt like you were tailing a log file. And that's how, that's when I say real-time log, this is what it should feel like. Um, it's commonplace these days, we sort of expect this, but this was a huge innovation in the world of CDNs. Now, you've probably noticed that I've used this term quite a bit, real time. Um, a lot of these things that I've talked about kind of started out as features, but it's this particular attribute of these features that made them much more like primitives. We've talked about APIs for logging, for configs, we've talked about real time purging, all these things which were started as features, their real timeness, kind of made them primitives, and primitives that you can now build your applications with. And it's this particular attribute that made them into those primitives. And it's this particular attribute that turned what used to be a black opaque box, which was the way we looked at CDNs, into something more, into something which had a set of real-time primitives and interfaces, uh, and it transformed the way those features used to look into building blocks for our applications. Uh, it's this uh, sort of ability to gain control and visibility into what we were building that turned these products more to look more like platforms. It was now through these, through these features and through these sort of primitives, we were able to, developers were able to develop using the features of the platform um, w and build with those features and with those primitives rather than in spite of those. So rather than like configuring and building things around the limitations, now you could embrace those uh, features and primitive and build with them. This was huge because it was uh, enabling to the developers. It was, a, and it, it uh, encouraged self-service. And most of all, it really encouraged creativity and curiosity, uh, which are my favorite off uh, product, byproducts of this, because once you have powerful features, powerful primitives, and curiosity and creativity, you uh, get great things that come out of it. So we got this right here on um, an evolutionary story. We're probably six years ago, seven years ago. Um, the natural next step now that we had these primitives in place um, was edge logic, what we call edge logic, which basically means being able to run parts of the logic of your application at the edge of the network. Here are some examples I threw up, things like uh, being able to cache APIs, doing authentication at the edge, A-B testing at the edge, dynamic load balancing at the edge, captures at the edge, um, a paywall uh, validation at the edge, very interesting uses, use cases with geofencing at the edge. All these things qualify as things that we could do at the edge. And we couldn't uh, with edge logic, and these are things that we couldn't do unless we had those primitives in place. You can't really roll out features like this and logic like this unless they could get rolled out in real time, unless you could iterate 100 times a day. Um, so we had to get those primitives, primitives in place and correct before we could venture into this world. These are just examples. There are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of others. And even though I'm not a security expert, I'm not gonna talk a lot about security at all, this is the sort of time where security became a feature of these platforms because it made sense to do this at the edge of the network because it, the perimeter is where you want to have security. But again, if you think about it, security policies should be able to get rolled out to the network 
network in real time. And again, we need those primitives for that to happen. If there's a violation, if there is an alert, if there is any sort of security logging that needs to be done, those logs better be delivered in real time, and we need those primitives to get there. So this is why security makes uh, perfect sense to have as a feature set for these platforms. You think all these things uh, together and consider them together, and this term CDN is not really appropriate anymore. And this is the time that we started calling them edge clouds. The way I think about it is the classic uh, centralized cloud allowed you to scale your applications horizontally and vertically. This is a classic story. The way I think about it is edge clouds allow you to scale your applications radially out to the edge of the network near, um, near your users. This allows you to distribute your code as well as your content, which is what you were used to with CDNs, and it lets you run parts of your application wherever they make sense. Some things are latency sensitive and should run close to the users. Other things are less sen uh, latency sensitive and can run uh, at an origin. And because we have those configuration and those APIs in place, you can integrate all of this into your development stack and be able to do, you know, there's plenty of examples of this being integrated into a CICD pipeline, for example. Your users are happy because they're getting a very performant uh, application experience. You're happy because uh, you're basically developing the best version of your application and deploying it to the world. Look at all these smiley faces. Uh, what a great way to have a happy story and maybe a happy ending to a story, but, we're actually just getting started because we needed all those things to be in place before we can take the leap to the next um, level. When I talked about edge logic and gave you some examples, these are all cool, and I can make a slide that's got 40, 50, 60 more of those things that are all very cool, but what would be really cool, what would be better than me giving you examples is the other way around. In other words, is you running your code at the edge of the network. And when I say your code, I mean the code that you write in the language of your choice, deployed to the edge of the network to run on these platforms. So now you can definitely see that CDN is not the right term for these anymore. Once you do this, once you deploy your code to the edge of the network in any language that you prefer, there's a whole host of new possibility, possibilities that emerge. Things that have to do with rewriting requests or responses, like bodies of requests and responses. Things that have to do with stitching content at the edge, uh, close to the users. Um, write, integrating third-party libraries into your code and running those at the edge of the network. Uh, we have examples of very creative um, GraphQL caching and routing at the edge using uh, custom code, custom code that our customers wrote. We have great examples of content assembly at the edge of the network. Uh, if you're familiar with ESI, think of ESI on ACID because of uh, code that um, our customers are actually able to write. Uh, for those of you that are in the world of streaming, we have very, very, very creative uses of this for rewriting manifests as they go out to um, video players. Now, this is what we call edge compute. And it's great for me to stand up here and go from CDN to edge compute in three slides and wave my hands and get there in two and a half minutes. But this is extremely difficult. Um, there are so many things you have to worry about as you think about edge compute. You think there's, you have to build a distributed compiler. You have a memory and a processor isolation model you have to worry about. There is a security sandboxing model that you have to worry about. There's multi-tenancy that you need to worry about. There's latency that you need to worry about. Every request now runs a piece of code. Every single request runs code. So the latency, the startup latency of that needs to be in the microseconds for it to be performant and acceptable to run on a platform that's used to serving users with millisecond. Um, uh, latency that's mostly in the network, not even in the servers. So all this, th these are things that you need to worry about. And this is a very complicated problem. It took Fastly two and a half years to get something like this out. It's very complicated and I've trivialized it. I just wanna make a point that it's a lot harder said than done and just the fact that I got there in three slides doesn't mean it's like easy. And anybody that tells you otherwise is either lying or did this poorly. Um, now. When you have this, when you're actually running code at the edge of the network, you have some interesting traffic models and some interesting um, traffic patterns that emerge. Um, you, you, know, you have the network edge and users, basically their interface to the network edge is through HTTP. So imagine your code just sitting there and terminating and responding to these HTTP requests on its own without the origin being involved at all. This is probably what you refer to as serverless, but it's just the beginning. 
you can also have traffic go through your code to your own origin or any number of different origins. You can manipulate this content on the way in. You can manipulate the content on the way out. Integrate and we'll have multiple requests go to multiple origins, stitch things at the edge, cache them independently. All these things are possible when it's your code that's actually sitting in front of that um, HTTP request. You can also have a hybrid version where you think about it as a data plane. You have a lot of like traditional old school CDN things happening on the data plane. And some of your requests are being routed to a piece of your code that do more interesting things or more complicated things or things that need to be done at a much higher uh, level of complication. Not just one piece of code, maybe even multiple pieces of code. You can manage each of those pieces independently. You can iterate each of those pieces independently. You can have them in different repos, if you like, um, and be able to iterate all on each of them individually, and basically have a model that's a composite of traditional CDN functions and code that you've written that does uh, cool, special things to each of the requests that go through. One of my favorite models is this one where your code is actually sitting on the side and doesn't even see the traffic. You, you think of it as a policy server or a route server or an authentication server where the data plane does a lookup to your code, figures out if, you know, what's a, what's a policy that needs to apply to a piece of traffic. Does it need to block it? Does it need to send it here? Does it need to send it there? All those things can happen without that piece of code even seeing the HTTP request go through. It's just metadata going back and forth between the two pieces. And these are all things that become enabled at the edge of the network when you have your code running there um, doing whatever it is that you need it to do. Now, again, this is all just the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of things, we only had 20 minutes together. There's a lot of things I didn't get into. Uh, what about file systems? What system interfaces do we expose? Uh, we didn't talk about data at all. What's the data model at the edge? What's the read-only data model at the edge? What's the read-write model at the edge? What's the consistency model at the edge? These are all things that are now problems that we have to work on and bring to you so you can deploy more and more versions of your applications at the edge of the network. But we couldn't do any of these things if we didn't have those um, primitives in place. Uh, that's a crash course in the evolution of CDN. I know I went very fast and I gave you a lot of information. We have a booth here, we have, where's my Fastly friends? Wave your hands, Fastly friends. We're here, I can talk about this stuff until I'm blue in the face, so come find us and we can talk about it more. But hopefully this was enough to uh, make you hopefully think about CDNs as something more than what you thought about they were. Thank you for your time.